Your alarm clock rings. You don't budge. You stay in bed. You shut your eyes. It's not a premeditated act. It's not an act at all, but a failure to act. An act left undone. Acts you avoid doing. You went to bed early. Your sleep was peaceful. You'd set your alarm, and you heard it ring. You waited for it to ring for several minutes at least, already woken up by the heat, or the light, or the waiting. You don't move. You won't move. Instead of you, someone else, a replica, a ghostly, careful double, is performing one by one the acts you no longer perform. He gets up, gets washed, gets dressed, shaves, leaves. You let him dash down the stairs, race across the street, catch his bus on the run, reach the examination hall on schedule. You get up too late. You're not going to say on four, eight, or twelve ruled pages what you know you should think about alienation, or the working class, or modern life and leisure, about the white-collar worker, or automation, about other directedness, about Marx as critic of de Tocqueville, or Margaret Mead versus Marcuse. You wouldn't have said anything in any case, since your knowledge is small and your opinions are non-existent. Your seat remains empty. You won't get your degree. You'll never begin your advanced studies. You'll give up your studies altogether. As always, you make yourself a cup of instant coffee. As always, you add a few drops of condensed milk. You don't wash. You barely get dressed. In a pink plastic basin, you soak three pairs of socks. You don't wait outside the examination hall and ask about the questions submitted to the perspicacity of the candidates. You don't go to the cafe where, as always, habit would have you go to meet your friends. Next morning, one of them will climb the six flights that lead to your room. You let him knock on your door and wait. Knock again, a little louder. Wait again. Knock feebly. Speak your name softly. Hesitate and go back down. Others came the next day and the day after that. They knocked, spoke through the door, slipped in messages. You remain lying on the narrow couch with your arms behind your head and your knees raised. You don't want to see anyone, or talk, or think, or go out, or move. It's on a day like this, a little later, a little sooner, that the unsurprising revelation comes to you. Something has gone wrong. You don't know how to live. You'll never know. The sun beats on the metal roofing. The heat in the attic room is unbearable. 
You sit wedged between the couch and the bookcase with an open book in your lap. You stopped reading a long time ago. Your eyes stare at a plain wooden bookcase, at a pink plastic basin where six socks stagnate. Smoke from the cigarette you left lying in the ashtray rises in a straight or nearly straight line and spreads in a wavering layer beneath the tiny cracks of the ceiling. Something is snapped. You no longer feel secure. Something that until now fortified you and warmed your heart begins to fail. The sense of your existence. A feeling of belonging to the world. Of being immersed in it. Your past, present and future merge. Becoming nothing more than the heaviness of your limbs. Your insidious headache. The tepid bitterness of instant coffee. This attic passageway you use as a room. Nine feet seven inches long. Five feet eight inches wide, just over fifty-four square feet. This garret you haven't stirred from for several hours, for several days. You sit on a couch too short for you to stretch out to your full length at night, too narrow for you to turn over without being careful. With an eye by now almost spellbound, you watch a pink plastic basin containing no less than six socks. You stay in your room, not eating, not reading, hardly moving. You watch the basin, the bookcase, your knees, your eyes in the cracked mirror, the cup, the light switch. You listen to street sounds, to the dripping faucet on the landing, to the noises your neighbor makes, clearing his throat, having a coughing fit, his kettle whistling. You follow on the ceiling the winding line of a thin crack, a fly's pointless wanderings, the perhaps calculable progression of shadows. You're 25 years old. You have 29 teeth, three shirts and eight socks, 500 francs a month to survive on, a few books you no longer read, a few records you no longer listen to. You don't want to remember anything else. You sit and all you want is to wait. Just wait until there's nothing more to wait for. You don't see your friends. You don't answer the door. You don't go down and get your mail. You don't return the books you borrowed from the teacher's college library. You don't write your parents. You don't go out till dark, like the rats, cats, and freaks. You loiter in the streets. You sneak into grubby little movies on the main boulevards. Sometimes you walk all night. Sometimes you sleep all day. You're a drifter, a sleepwalker, a clam. You feel scarcely fit for life, for action, for craft. You just want to endure. You just want to wait and forget. You don't reject anything. You don't deny anything. You've stopped moving forward. But you never did move forward. You don't start over again. You're there. You can't imagine what's worth doing farther on. There was a paragraph you'd lost track of, a cup of instant coffee that suddenly tasted too bitter, and a pink plastic basin filled with blackish water, with six socks floating in it. And on a day in May, when the weather was too hot, the association of these things was enough, was almost enough, to make something snap, spoil, burst, and to make clear as broad daylight one small truth, 
as sad and silly as a dunce's cap. You don't want to go on. The night shelters you, so does your room, the narrow couch you lie on, the ceiling you're perpetually rediscovering. At night, alone in the middle of the crowded streets, you almost manage to feel happy in the noise and lights, in the bustle, in forgetfulness. You follow the surge that comes and goes from one end of the boulevards to the other, then back again. Blank spells, dead ends, a fleeting wish not to hear or see any more, to be mute and motionless, crazy dreams of solitude, amnesiac wandering in the country of the blind, cold lights, silent faces your gaze slides past. As if underneath the quiet, reassuring story of the well-behaved child and good student, underneath these apparent, too apparent signs of growing up, height marked in pencil on the bathroom door, report cards, long pants, first cigarettes, shaving rash, drinking, the key under the doormat on Saturday night, your first woman, your first flight, the baptism of fire, as if always underneath these things another thread had run, always there, always kept at a distance, a thread now woven into the familiar pattern of your rediscovered life, into the empty setting of your deserted life, underlying images of the truth that's come to light of the withdrawal so long postponed, the appeal for calm, inert blurred images, overexposed snapshots, almost white, almost lifeless, almost petrified. A small town street, closed shutters, colorless shadows, flies buzzing in an empty guard room, a living room under gray slip covers, dust particles suspended in a ray of light, bleak countrysides, a graveyard on Sunday, drives in the automobile. A man sitting on a narrow couch on a Thursday afternoon with an open book in his lap, staring into nowhere. You're nothing but an uncertain shadow, a hard nugget of indifference, a non-committal glance evading other glances, with lips that don't speak and eyes gone dead. From now on, the passing reflections of your somnolent life will appear in puddles, in shop windows, on the glistening bodies of cars. Water drips from the faucet on the landing. Your neighbor is sleeping. The faint throbbing of a waiting diesel engine does more to heighten than disturb the quiet of the street. Forgetfulness seeps into your memory. The cracks in the ceiling outline an improbable maze. There were these empty days, with the heat in your room like a furnace, an oven, and six socks in the pink plastic basin, like limp sharks, like sleeping whales. The alarm clock that hasn't rung, that doesn't ring, that won't ring the time for you to wake up. You lie down, you let yourself glide away, you plunge into sleep. Your room is the center of the world. This lair, the attic garret that has permanently absorbed the smell of you, the bed you slip into alone, the bookcase, the linoleum floor, the ceiling whose cracks, flakes, spots, and bumps you've counted a hundred thousand times, the basin, the window, 
the wallpaper where you know every flower, the newspapers that you read and reread, and that you'll read and reread again, the cracked mirror that's never reflected anything but your face divided into three unequal parts. This is where your kingdom begins and ends, and around it concentric circles of ever-present sound stretch out, your only link with the world, the drop of water from the faucet of the water outlet on the landing, the noises your neighbor makes, the town's endless hum. At the intersection below, the steady sequence of breaking, stopping, starting, accelerating, gives time a rhythm almost as even as the incessant drip or as the bell tower of the neighboring church. It's been a long time since your alarm clock stopped at 5.15. Time no longer enters the silence of your room. It's outside, a lasting, obsessive, inaccurate, rather dubious medium. Time passes, but you never know the time. It's 10 o'clock, maybe 11. It's late, it's early. Day breaks, night falls. The sounds never stop altogether. Time never stops altogether, even if it's no longer anything but a tiny breach in the wall of silence, a somnolent murmur forgotten bit by bit, scarcely distinguishable from your heartbeats. Your room is the most beautiful of desert islands, and Paris is a desert that no one has ever traversed. You need nothing except for this calm, silence, torpor, where the risings of your thorax and your heartbeats are the sole evidence of your patient survival. to want nothing else. Wait until there is nothing else to wait for. Drift, sleep, to let yourself be carried along by riversides, streets, gutters, gratings, be led by piers, hug walls, to waste time, to be undesiring, unspiteful, unrebellious. As time passes, the life that opens up before you will be free of movement, harshness, and agitation. Day after day, season after season, something that is never going to end will begin. Your vegetable life, your obliterated life. This is how you learn to endure. Sometimes, master of time, master of the world, little spider at the center of your web, you reign over Paris. You control the north by the opera, the south by the Louvre, east and west by Saint Honoré. You have everything to learn, everything that can't be taught, solitude, indifference, patience, Silence. You're alone, and since you're alone, you have to stop looking at the time. You let yourself go. It's almost easy for you. You let the passing time erase the remembrance of faces, addresses, phone numbers, lips, voices. You forget that you've learned to forget. You no longer go into cafes and look anxiously around them, even the back rooms, searching for you don't know who. 
You no longer look for anyone in the lines that form every two hours outside the seven movies on a street in the Latin Quarter. You're alone. You learn to walk like a man alone. Stroll. Loiter. See without looking and look without seeing. You learn to be transparent, motionless, still, non-existent. You learn how to go on sitting, go on lying down, go on standing up. You learn to look at paintings as if they were parts of a wall, and at walls as if they were pictures where you effortlessly decipher thousands of roots, unavoidable labyrinths, languages no one dares read, ruined countenances. You explore an island in the Seine. You start down the longest street in the city. You go out to one end of town, then the other. You walk slowly. You retrace your steps. You dawdle in front of shop windows. You go and sit on the ledge of a midtown bridge, and you watch an eddy under the arches gather and disperse. Beyond, barges pass, in time overwhelming the play of water against the piers. Fishermen sitting motionless watch the steady drifting of their floats. You walk round the edges of playgrounds, overtaken by children who run holding a metal ruler against the gratings. You sit down on benches whose sculpted bronze feet have the shape of lion's paws. Old, lame caretakers converse with nannies from another age. In earth just sandy enough, the toe of your shoe traces circles, squares, initials. You walk back and forth in front of the entrance to the catacombs. You plant yourself under the Eiffel Tower. You cross every bridge. You walk along every embankment. You visit every museum, the science museum, the aquarium. You go and see the roses at the flower show, Montmartre by night, the city markets at dawn, the stations at rush hour, the Place de la Concorde at noon in mid-August. In the Luxembourg Gardens, you watch pensioners playing bridge, pinochle, or rummy. On a bench, not far from you, motionless, feet together, chin resting on the knob of a cane that he grips with both hands, a petrified old man stares into space for hours at a time. You admire him. You look for his secret or weakness. But he seems impregnable. He doesn't even drool. He doesn't move his lips. He hardly blinks. The sun turns round him. Perhaps his entire attention is devoted to following his shadow. He must have picked out his reference points long ago. Perhaps his craziness, if he is crazy, is to think of himself as a sundial. You want to be like him. Nevertheless, no doubt it's one consequence of being such a very young candidate for old age. You lose patience all too quickly. In spite of you, your foot shifts in the sand. Your eyes wander. Your fingers clasp and unclasp incessantly. You get lost. You go round in circles. Sometimes you set yourself absurd objectives. Domenil, Clignancourt, Gouvion Saint Cyr, the Postal Museum. You go into bookstores and leaf through books without reading them. You go into picture galleries, stopping in front of each painting, tilting your head to the right, closing one eye, drawing closer, moving back so as to see better. 
On the way out, you sign a large, illegible flourish, followed by a false address. You sit down in the back of a cafe and you read the paper line by line, systematically. It's excellent training. You read the paper line by line, systematically. It's excellent training. Five hundred or a thousand news items have passed before your scrupulous and attentive gaze, but your memory has been careful to retain none of them. You've read with an equal lack of interest that steel profits are down, that the New York market is buoyant, that for home financing you should trust the oldest bank in France and its network of specialists, that there are six million dollars worth of damages in the wake of Hurricane Barbara, that John Paul and Lucas are pleased to announce the birth of their little sister Lucy. You may still be amazed that the combination of some 30 typographic symbols, according to what are ultimately very simple rules, is capable of generating these thousands of statements every day. But why let them absorb you? Why decipher them? All that matters is for time to slip by and for nothing to touch you. Your eyes read the lines deliberately, one after the other. When facing the world, the indifferent man is neither ignorant nor hostile. Your purpose isn't to rediscover the robust pleasures of illiteracy, but to read without making any distinction in your reading matter. Your purpose isn't to go naked, but to dress without any implication of either fussiness or neglect. Your purpose isn't to let yourself die of starvation, but just to keep yourself nourished. Eating, sleeping, walking, and dressing. Such things should only be actions, matters of course, not proofs, not tokens. Your clothing, your food, and your reading matter are no longer meant to speak for you. You won't give them the exhausting, impossible job of representing you. You put on your shirt and jacket. You read the paper. You go pinballing. Once or twice a day, rarely more, you absorb a quite precisely calculable ration of proteins and glucides in the form of a piece of broiled beef, potato strips seared in boiling oil, a glass of red wine. More exactly, a steak that definitely isn't tenderloin. French fries, which no one will dignify with the name of shoestring potatoes, and wine whose vintage no sane person would inquire about. But your stomach can no longer tell the difference, any more than your palate. Words have been a greater obstacle. It's taken a certain time for the meat to stop being leathery, the potatoes greasy, the wine sour. For these adjectives that conjure up soup kitchens and meals for the needy to lose their substance little by little, and for the misery, the poverty, the want, need, and shame that had inevitably clung to this grease-made potato, this toughness made meat, this sourness made wine, to stop affecting you or troubling you. No humiliations attend your meals. You drink red wine, you eat a steak with french fries. You invent elaborate circuits, 
which are further complicated by innumerable rules that force you into long detours. You go and see the sights. You take counts of churches, equestrian statues, pissoirs, Russian restaurants. You go and look at the public works underway. Streets ripped up like plowed fields, ditches, buildings being raised. You come back to your room and flop onto the couch that's too narrow for you. You arrange the cracks in the ceiling. Often you play solitaire. You deal four rows of 13 cards face up on the couch. You remove the four aces. The game consists of arranging the remaining 48 cards using the spaces made available by eliminating the aces. If one such space is first in its row, you have the right to put a deuce on it. If it follows, let's say, a six, you can put a seven of the same suit. After a seven, an eight. After an eight, a nine. After a jack, a queen. If the space follows a king, you can put nothing on it, and it's lost. Luck plays almost no part in this kind of solitaire. You can foresee well in advance when the four freed spaces will bring you up against kings, if you play them in order. But the thing to do is use one space, then another, go back to the first, take the third, the fourth, then the second again. Nevertheless, you seldom win. A moment always comes when all your moves are blocked. In theory, you have the right to make two more tries. But no sooner does the game appear to you in jeopardy than you pick up all the cards, shuffle them two or three times, and deal them again for a new game. You shuffle the cards, deal them, remove the four aces, look the deal over. Little by little, the game takes shape. Obstacles appear, possibilities come to light. Here, a card is in place already. There, changing a single card will dispose of five or six in one go. There, a troublesome king can't be dislodged. You almost never win. Sometimes you cheat, a little, rarely, more and more rarely. It's not winning that matters to you. What sense could your winning have? But you play more and more often, for longer and longer sessions, sometimes all afternoon, or the minute you get up, or else through the night. There's something about the game that fascinates you, even more, perhaps, than the play of water against bridges, more than the ceiling labyrinths, more than the barely opaque stems that drift slowly across the surface of your cornea. According to its position and the possibilities of the moment, each card takes on an almost thrilling density. You protect, you destroy, you construct, you calculate, you draw up plan after plan, pointless exercises, unsubstantiated perils, pitiful solutions. Forty-eight cards shackle you to your room, and you feel almost happy when a ten is in place, when no king stands in your path, or almost unhappy when all your long, drawn-out reckonings end in the same hopeless result as though this lonely, wordless strategy provided your only course of action, as though it had become your justification. It's dark. You shut your eyes. You open them. Viral bacterial shapes inside your eye or on the surface of your cornea drift slowly downwards, disappear. Bubbles or discs stems, twisted filaments whose arrangement delineates some half-imaginary creature. You lose track of them. You find them again. You rub your eyes, and the filaments explode and proliferate. Time has passed. You doze. You put down the open book on the couch by your side. Everything is a vague droning. Your breathing is astonishingly regular. Hours, days.
stress and you detach yourself from everything. You withdraw from everything. It's almost sometimes with a kind of ecstasy that you discover you're free. Nothing worries you or pleases you or displeases you. In this unwearing life, where delights issue forth as moments without consequence, you find a happiness almost perfect, fascinating, at times pregnant with new emotions. You live in a happy lull, in a void full of quiet from which you expect nothing. You're invisible, translucent, transparent. You no longer exist. Successions of hours, successions of days, the passage of the seasons, the flow of time. You survive without cheerfulness and without melancholy, without past and without future. Just like that, simply, obviously, like a drop of water forming on the faucet of the water outlet on the landing, like six socks soaking in a pink plastic basin, like a fly or like a clam, like a tree, like a rat. In time, your coldness becomes epic. Your eyes have lost whatever made them bright. Your outline has acquired a perfect droop. The corners of your mouth reveal a serenity free of weariness and bitterness. You glide through the streets untouchable, protected by the careful shabbiness of your clothes and the indefiniteness of your step. You make nothing but routine gestures. You speak only words that are necessary. You never say please, hello, thank you, goodbye. You don't ask your way. You loiter. You walk. Each moment is as good as any other. All space looks the same. You're never in a hurry, never lost. You're not sleepy. You're not hungry. You let yourself go. You let yourself be carried along. It's enough for the crowd to be going up or down the Champs Elysees. Enough if ahead of you a dreary figure bears off into a dreary street, or for there to be light, or a lack of light, sound, or a lack of sound, a wall, a group, a fountain, sand, arcades, trees, a poster, stones, a crosswalk, a shop window, a flashing light, a street name, a notion stand, a flight of steps, a round square. You walk, you don't walk, you sleep, you don't sleep. You buy the paper or you don't buy it. You eat or you don't eat. You sit, you lie down, you stay on your feet, you slip into dim movie theaters. You light a cigarette, you cross the street, you cross the river, you stop, you start. You play the pinball machine or you don't. Indifference has neither beginning nor end. It's an immutable condition that nothing can shake. You have no more than elementary reflexes. You don't cross when the light is red. You shelter yourself from the wind to light your cigarette. You dress more warmly on winter mornings. You change your sweater, your socks, your undershorts and undershirt about once a week. Indifference dissolves language and crosses signals. You're patient, but you don't wait. You're free, but you don't choose. You're available, and nothing summons you. You hear without ever listening. You see without ever looking. Ceiling cracks, floorboards, patterns in tile flooring, the wrinkles around your eyes, water, 
Trees, stones, passing cars, clouds in the sky taking the shapes of clouds. You live now in the midst of what is unlimited. Each day is made up of silences and sounds, of lights and darks, of layers, of waitings, of shutters. You slide, you give yourself slack, to seek emptiness, run from it, to walk on, stop short, sit back, lean forward, settle down, stretch out. A robot's gestures, rising, washing, shaving, dressing. A cork in water, swimming with the tide, following the throng, loitering. Summer, dense silence, closed shutters, dead streets, dusty pavements, the almost black green of motionless leaves. Winter, the cold light of shop windows and street lamps, cafe doors fogged over, black stumps of dead trees. Your life has no surprises. You're safe. You sleep, you eat, you walk, you go on living like a laboratory rat a careless experimenter might have forgotten in its maze. No values, no preferences. Your indifference is consistent. A gray man for whom gray has no grayness. Not insensitive, non-committal. Water attracts you like stone. Darkness like light, heat like cold. All that exists is your gait and your gaze, which stops and slides away without noticing what's beautiful or ugly, familiar or surprising retaining nothing but associations of shapes and lights that gather and disperse unendingly and everywhere, in your eye, on ceilings, at your feet, in the sky, in your cracked mirror, in water, on stones, in crowds, squares, avenues, playgrounds and boulevards, trees and gratings, men and women, children and dogs, people waiting, throngs, automobiles and mannequins, edifices, facades, columns, capitals, sidewalks, gutters, sandstone cobbles gleaming in fine rain, silences, uproars, crowds in stations, in stores, on the boulevards, streets packed with people, platforms packed, empty streets on August Sundays, Mornings, evenings, nights, dawns, and dusks. You are now the nameless master of the world, one on whom history no longer has a grip, one who no longer feels the rain fall, who no longer sees the night draw on. You know only what is plain in you, your life going on, your breathing, your step. You see people come and go, Crowds and things gather and disperse. In the tiny window of a notion shop, you see a curtain rod, and all at once your gaze fastens on it. You go your way. You're beyond reach, like a tree, like a clam, like a rat.
But rats don't take hours to fall asleep. Rats don't wake up with a start, panic-stricken, drenched with sweat. Rats don't dream. How can you withstand your dreams? Rats don't bite their nails, certainly not methodically, hour after hour, until the tips of their claws are no more than a spreading wound. You rip the horny matter halfway down, maiming the flesh it's attached to. You tear the dead skin almost the entire length of the top joints until drops of blood appear, until your fingers hurt so that for hours the slightest contact is too unbearable for you to grip anything, and you have to soak your hands in distilled water. As far as you know, rats don't go pinballing. You stayed glued to the machines for hours, for nights, furious and feverish. You groan as you follow the rebounds of the steel ball, jerking your hips into the metal casing. You fight wildly against the bumpers and lights, against Gottlieb and the scores. Painted women with ignited eyes and lowered fans. You can't wrestle with a pinball machine. You can't exchange views with it or make it express what it can't say. No matter how much you squeeze and grunt against it, it won't return the affection you feel or the love you seek or the lust that's tearing you apart. You loiter in the streets, you go into a movie. You loiter in the streets, you go into a cafe. You loiter in the streets, you watch trains go by. You loiter in the streets, you go into a movie to see a film like the one you just saw. You go out. You loiter in the streets that are too brightly lit. You go back up to your room. You undress, you slip between the sheets. You put out the lights, you shut your eyes. It's the hour when dream women gather around you, their clothes all too quickly shed. It's the hour when you dull yourself with books read a hundred times before, when you turn over a hundred times without being able to sleep. It's the hour when, with your eyes wide open in the darkness and your hand groping at the foot of the couch for an ashtray, matches, and one last cigarette, you calmly measure how far down you've come. You get up during the night now. You loiter in the streets. You go and settle on bar stools and stay there for hours, till the very end, with a beer in front of you, or a black coffee, or a glass of red wine. You're alone and adrift. You walk down desolate avenues, past stunted trees, stripped facades, darkened entrances, you go into the inexhaustibly hideous districts of warehouses and stockyards. You encounter only drinking fountains long since gone dry, grimy churches, ripped up work sites, bleak walls, morasses stagnating near sewer vents, monstrous gates of manufactories. Under the metal footbridges of the quarter called Europe, steam locomotives spew puffs of white smoke. An outlying boulevard, a crowded square, impatient throngs raising their eyes skyward. Your doom hasn't been sudden. It's edged its way in almost blandly. It has thoroughly infiltrated your life, your movements, your time, your room. It's taken hold of the faults in the ceiling, the wrinkles of your face in the cracked mirror, the upturned cards. It seeped out in drops of water from the faucet at the water outlet. It sounded every 15 minutes in the neighboring bell tower. There was a pitfall, the feeling that sometimes approached elation, the pride, the sense of intoxication, You believed you only needed the city, the stones and streets, 
the crowds that carried you with them, needed only a cheap seat at a neighborhood movie, needed only your room, your warren, your cage, your lair. Once again, you deal the 52 cards on your narrow couch. Your powers have deserted you. The pitfall was this dangerous illusion of being impenetrable, of affording the world no hold on you, of gliding on, untouchable, with your open eyes staring straight ahead, perceiving everything, retaining nothing, a man without memory or terror. But there's no way out, no miracle, nothing was revealed. You sit above the river, legs dangling. You hug the soiled walls of dark streets. You remove the four aces from your 52 upturned cards. How many times have you repeated the same mangled gestures, the same itineraries that never lead you anywhere? You only find refuge in your stingy expedience, your stupid patience, the thousand and one detours that bring you back every time to your starting point, from playgrounds to museums, from cafes to movie theaters, from riversides to parks, waiting rooms and stations, lobbies and big hotels, five and tens, bookstores, subway corridors, trees, stones, water, clouds, sand, bricks, light, wind, rain. The only thing that matters is your solitude. Whatever you do, wherever you go, everything you see is of no importance. Everything you do is pointless. Everything you seek is false. The only thing that exists is your solitude, which you come face to face with sooner or later, every time. Only silence has answered you, but those words, those thousands, millions of words that caught in your throat, words in a rush, shouts of joy, words of love, giggles. When are you going to find them again? You live in dread of silence now, but aren't you the most silent of all? The freaks have entered your life. The rats, your fellows, your brothers. Tens and hundreds and thousands of freaks. You spot them and identify them by invisible signs. Their furtive exits, their silence, their distracted, wavering, fearful gaze that turns away as it meets yours. Light still shines in the middle of the night from the attic windows of their squalid rooms. Their steps echo in the night. And those ageless faces, those frail or flabby shapes, those stooped gray shoulders, every hour of the day you know they're around you. Their shadow becomes you. You become their shadow. You haunt their lairs and hideouts. You use the same places for refuge and asylum. Playgrounds, museums, cafes, stations, subways, outdoor markets. Disasters seated like you on benches, incessantly tracing and erasing the same flawed circle in the dusty sand. Readers of newspapers found in trash cans. They make the same long circuits as you, just as pointless, just as slow. They linger like you in front of the maps and subway stations. They eat their rolls seated at the edge of the river. Exiles, pariahs, outcasts. They brush the walls as they walk with lowered heads, drooping shoulders, their nervous hands scraping window ledges. Weary motions of those who are vanquished, the biters of dust. You keep your eye on them. You pursue them. You hate them. Freaks cowering in garrets. Freaks in slippers shuffling around market stalls. Freaks with glassy eyes. Freaks like automatons. Freaks that drivel. You rub shoulders with them. You're always among them. You force your way through them. Sleepwalkers, big dopes, old men, half-wits with berets pulled down over their eyes, drunks, 
senile men trying to repress the convulsive trembling of their cheeks, farm boys astray in the big town, widows, finks, senior citizens. They've come to you. They've clutched your arm. It's as if you, the loner, had been assaulted by all the other loners, as if the only meetings possible in the time it takes to drink a glass of wine at the same cafe counter were with people who never talk or who talk by themselves. Crazy old men, drunken old women, refugees. They grab the lapels of your jacket. They blow their breath in your face. They come to you with their shy steps and their sweet smiles, their leaflets and their badges, pitiful crusaders and idiotic causes, pathetic entertainers passing the hat for their guild, downtrodden orphans selling placemats, skinny widows battling for the rights of household pets, all the ones who accost you, detain you, fondle you to blurt in your face their petty revelations and eternal questionings, their good deeds and their true way, sandwich men of one true faith that will save the world, sallow complexions, frayed collars, stutterers telling you the story of their lives, the story of their jails, their rest homes, their improbable travels, their hospital wards, old school teachers who advocate spelling reforms, armchair strategists, dowsers, healers, visionaries, all the ones who live with their obsessions, the cast-offs, the wrecks, the inoffensive senile freaks that bartenders have fun with, filling their glasses too full for them to raise to their lips, old fur wraps knocking back little glasses of Cointreau and trying to keep their dignity. And all the others, the worst ones, the smug ones, the smart ones, the pleased with themselves, the ones who think they know, the ones who smile knowingly, the overweight ones and the young for their age, car dealers, legionnaires, good timers, greasy haired types from out of town, the well to do, the jerks, freaks who know they're right, who want you on their side, who look you over and challenge you, freaks with big families, freak children and freak dogs, thousands of freaks held up by red lights, freaks with their yapping females, freaks with mustaches, freaks in waistcoats and suspenders, tourist freaks, freaks in their Sunday best, the freaky crowds. You loiter, but the crowd no longer carries you with it. Night no longer gives you shelter. You walk, still, forever, a tireless, immortal walker. You search, you wait. You loiter in the petrified city, polished stones without a crack in the scrub facades, congealed garbage cans, empty chairs where concierge come and sit. You drift through the dead city, rotten city, despicable, hideous city, dismal city with dismal lights and dismal streets, dismal comics and dismal stage shows, dismal lines outside dismal movies, dismal furniture and dismal stores, dark stations, barracks and sheds, grim beer halls in succession along the boulevards, city that's noisy or deserted, pallid or hysterical, gutted, ransacked, stained city, city swarming with don'ts, with locked gates and gratings, the graveyard city, putrid markets, the slums in the heart of Paris, the irresistible horror of avenues made for cops, provocation, repression, violence. Like a prisoner or a madman in a cell, like a rat in a maze looking for the way out, you scour Paris from one end to the other, like a starving man, like a messenger carrying a letter with no address.
for a flameless fire to eat away the planks of staircases. For streets to give way at their midpoint and reveal the gaping labyrinth of the sewers. For rest and mist to overrun the city. You haven't died, and you're no wiser. You haven't exposed your eyes to the blinding of the sun. Two tenth-rate actors haven't come for you, clutched you, fastened themselves so closely to you that if one were crushed, all three would perish. Merciful volcanoes have shown no concern for you. Your mother hasn't put your new secondhand clothes in order. You don't go to encounter for the millionth time the reality of experience, or forge in the smithy of your soul the uncreated conscience of your race. No old father, no old artificer will stand you in good stead. Not now, not ever. You've learned nothing. Except that solitude teaches nothing, that indifference teaches nothing. You were alone. You wanted the links between you and the world permanently severed. But you're such a small thing. You never did anything but wander through a big city and walk down a few miles of walls, shop windows, parks, and riversides. Indifference is useless. Your refusal is useless. Your uncommittedness means nothing. You thought you were passing through, going down avenues, drifting across the city, following the paths of crowds, unlocking the secrets of cracks and shadows. But nothing happened. No miracle. No explosion. Each counted day has only eroded your patience. Time should have stopped altogether. No one is strong enough to do battle with time. You were able to cheat, to win a few crumbs, a few seconds. But the bells of the neighboring church, the alternation of traffic lights at the intersection below, the predictable drip of water from the faucet of the water outlet on the landing have never stopped measuring the hours, minutes, days, and seasons. For a long while, you've built refuges and destroyed them. Schedules or idleness, drift or sleep, night watches, uncommitted moments, the vanishing of shadows and lights. You could, perhaps for a long while, still go on lying to yourself and dulling yourself. But the game's over. The world is still there. And you haven't changed. Indifference has not made you different. You haven't died. You haven't gone crazy. No curse weighs on your shoulders. No ordeal awaits you. No crow has designs on your eyeballs. No vulture has been punished with the indigestible chore of munching on your liver, morning, noon, and night. No one condemns you, and you've committed no offense. In spite of you, time, which watches over everything, has given you a solution. 
time, which knows the answer, has gone on passing. It's on a day like this, a little later, a little sooner, that everything starts again. Everything starts. Everything goes on. Stop speaking like a man in a dream. Look. Look at them. There they stand, posted around the town like silent sentinels. Thousands upon thousands of mortal men. On riversides and embankments, on the rain-drenched sidewalks of one crowded square, fixed in ocean reveries, waiting for spindrift, for the breaking of the tides and the raucous calls of seabirds. No, you're no longer the nameless master of the world, the one on whom history had no grip, the one who didn't feel the rain fall, the one who never saw the light draw on. You're no longer the inaccessible, translucent, transparent one. You're afraid. You wait. On that crowded square, you wait for the rain to stop falling. 